this isn't going to work out and I'm leaving. Yeah, it was uh, it, a very emotional time. It was just so hard to accept the fact that my wife was dying. Feel like a complete failure that I couldn't keep my marriage together. I did ask him, you know, what is the chances? And he said she'd be the first one ever to beat this type of cancer. I guess I'm really uh, looking at it as an opportunity. But, but I do know that with God in our life, that has made all the difference in the world. Things started getting a lot easier with God's help. It was just amazing. It was, uh, it, it was incredible. But if you can look at it and say, okay, I'm not going to know some things tomorrow, but let's enjoy today. Knowing that God is there for me and me accepting God in my life, I wouldn't be here today. Last week, we began a series called How to Get Through What You're Going Through. And last week, we began that tough journey of honestly facing how do we navigate life's losses, life's challenges, life's difficulties, life's suffering, and we also pointed out that maybe you're at a stage in life right now where everything is going great and you're really not facing any major challenges or losses. And all I would encourage you to do is take notes, tuck them away somewhere in your Bible or a place you can access them because sooner or later you will have to come back to this series. Um, as we think about this, last week we learned three very important truths as we looked at the story of Naomi and Ruth in the Old Testament. We learned, first of all, that loss is unavoidable. Secondly, grieving is a choice. Grieving is a very important part of the journey of getting through loss. And finally, God is determined to walk with you through that loss. You know, we saw that just as Ruth was a comfort to Naomi, she said, you know, wherever you go, that's where I'm going. Wherever you're going to, you know, be, that's where I'm going to be. Um, we, we saw that as Christians, the challenge and the call and the comfort for us was that the Ruth in our life, first of all, is Christ, who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And we also saw that the Ruth in our life can be the church family, so that wherever you go, we, brothers and sisters in Christ, will go with you, and wherever you stay, we will stay. Our church family can walk with you and end with me as we grieve and process whatever's happening in life, now or in the future. Now, we also wanted to give credit to Rick and Kay Warren from Saddleback Church for the inspiration and some of the insights of this series. This was the first series that they preached after their son committed suicide and when they returned back to ministry at their church. Talk about dealing with a loss. Now, in our church family, though, we also have several people going through uh, times of loss, times of change, times of challenge, and we need to hear those stories about how are you getting through what you're going through. So before we dig into the message this morning, let's begin by listening to the story of Dan and Marlene McDonald and hear what they're going through. So Dan and Marlene, I really appreciate you coming here today to talk to us um, as we are in this series that is focusing in on, you know, uh, getting through what you're going through. Okay. So would you right now just share with us what is it that you are going through at this time? Well, Marlene and I have been married for 34 years and for all of those years I've worked for one company. And around the middle of, a, middle of January I was told that my job was being eliminated. And uh, so as of the end of January I, I'm unemployed. Okay, so how did you feel at this point, Dan? Like, how did you feel when you were given this news? Well, it wasn't a complete surprise. I felt that there was going to be something happening, and um, I am concerned about providing for my family. And I guess that's my number one concern, is finding something else so that I can provide. We've always had a job yeah. with that company. Um, always. Um, I grew up in a home where my father always had a job. Um, I didn't know how I was going to work through it. So okay. I was kind of scared. Very scared, I guess, would be the other thing. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so what have you been doing um, since you've lost your job, Dan? What have you been doing? You know, how, you know, what have you been up to at this time? I've 
counseled people over the years that when you end a chapter in your life, it's a time to take stock mm -hmm. and figure out what you would do different going forward. So I've been doing some of that, uh, trying to walk the walk. This is an opportunity now that I've got some time to maybe take some courses, maybe do some things that I never had time to do before that'll help, you know, develop me and hopefully get me ready for the next the next chapter. Just just as this big question mark. You know, like do we sell our house? Do we what do we do? We've just never the the, the job always dictated where we lived. Um, it, it always dictated, you know, a lot of things. So tell me, how have you been getting through what you're going through? Well, being a good Baptist, <laughs> there's probably three things. One is, uh, I read a book 15 years ago called Leadership by the Book. And the message for me in that book, and, and it was, and I've read a lot of books, but this one it was a book that really spoke to me. And the message in it was, was trust God. When I realized that, yeah, trusting God is the answer, I had, a, I had a really, really deep sense of peace. So that's number one. Number two is shortly after I found out I was losing my job, a friend of mine said, you have to read this book, and it was another book on trust. What I got out of that book, and there was a lot, a lot that I got out of that book, but the one big thing that I got out of is that the opposite of trust is despair. Uh, so every time I find myself slipping that way, I say, well, if I'm, if I'm in despair, I'm not trusting God, and I want to trust God. So, um, and the third thing is Marlene and I have always had a desire to live our, our faith at a deeper level. And so if this is part of doing that, then bring it on. <laughs> you know, really, um, as much as we might not like uh, walking through it, if that's what it takes to live at, a, at your faith at a deeper level, then I'm okay with it. So tell me now, um, I'll get an answer from each of you on this one. What would you say would be a struggle that you face daily? I like to know what's next. Okay. I think it should probably come through. I, I kind of like to have a little plan. Um, I like to, it, that's what gets me up and gets me going in the morning. And I mean, I'm a quarter, get up at quarter to six kind of person and I, the last while I'm having a hard time doing that because I don't know. Yeah, it's, it, I really I struggle with that. Yeah, I'm really struggling with that because it's, it, I have no, nothing to motivate me day to day. Um, I, I need the long term thing and it's not there right now. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Well, I guess probably is, is just some of the stuff that I have to do now it takes me out of my comfort zone. Well, I want to thank you both so much for uh, for coming today and for sharing with us um, what you're going through and how you're getting through it. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say thank you to Dan and Marlene for willing to share their story of what they're going through right now. Um, so today, uh, just as we begin, again, I hope you have an outline. If you don't, you can also, you have a smart device, you can go on to the Uversion app, go to the live event. We have a complete outline there with a few other little Easter eggs in it. I mean, not real Easter eggs, I mean like little extras um, that you can uh, follow along on. Uh, but, but please feel free uh, to follow along in the outline today because, again, the, I think that the steps we're going to talk about, um, about how do you move when you're facing a challenge, a loss, a struggle? How do you move from that place of uncertainty as Marlene, uh, you know, spoke to it? Or that place of pain, or that place of shame, or that place of loss, how do you move from there to that place of peace? How, how do you get from here to there? Because the truth is, um, so many of us get stuck. Um, they get stuck with a major loss, a major setback. Um, they freeze up. And that loss defines their life. And again, like I said, whether that's a setback, a betrayal, a separation, a misfortune, an embarrassing failure, or a sinful choice, that brings all of these things, right, bring bad consequences. And, and please understand, again, 
Um, just as we said, loss is unavoidable. If you're a human being, you're going to experience loss. Another thing on our journey of humanity is that everybody is going to have bad things happen to them. Some bad things we cause, let's be honest, we cause them. Others of other bad things that come are like the impending northeasters that keep coming up on the Weather Channel every three days in New Brunswick. Um, now, you have three choices when bad things happen to you, and I have them as well. Uh, we can let them destroy us, we can let them define us, or we can let them develop us. We can let them destroy us. That's it. Life's over. Give up. I give up. Or we can just say, that's who I am. I went through this loss. That's who I am. Or we can let them develop us. Now, keeping that in mind, we're going to now look at a Bible story where something bad happened. Specifically, we're going to look, and if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up. Uh, otherwise, we have the whole passage right here in the outline that you can follow along. Um, but it's specifically a passage in dealing with the story of King David in the Bible where he lost his son. He had a baby son that died. Now, just before we read this scripture passage, I want you to remember a principle when we read scripture. It's found in Romans 15, verse 4. Listen to this. Everything written in the scriptures, everything was written to teach us in order that we might have hope. Now, sometimes when we read certain stories from the Bible... We go, what hope is there? And we need to dig into it and find out where is that hope. So let's hear now from the Word of God so that we might find hope. Now, now just to set it up a little bit before we read this passage, we come to this story knowing that David had been called out by a man of God, a prophet by the name of Nathan, who um, was el confronted David with his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, Uriah. I mean, when David decided to sin, he didn't play it safe. He went all the way. He committed adultery and then he committed murder. And he had it covered up, right? He covered it up. And about a, probably about a year later or so, Nathan approaches him in the king's court and approaches David and confronts him with his sin. And once David realizes he's been confronted, the masks fall out, he cries out to mercy for God. But Nathan says, there are going to be bitter fruit that you're going to reap now because of that sin. There's bitter consequences. And the first bitter consequence is that your newborn son is going to die. So now we come to hearing the word of God. So let's hear the word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 16. Now listen to this. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. And then on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him he wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill. They said, what drastic thing will he do now when we tell him the child is dead? And when David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. And then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. And after that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. His advisors were amazed. We don't understand you, they told him. While the child was still living, you wept and refused to eat. But now that the child is dead, you have stopped your mourning and are eating again. And David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and David named him Solomon. The Lord loved that child." Now, so in this story, I want us to now just sort of review the story and see what are some steps that David took as he moved from a place of loss and shame and grief to a place of peace. It is interesting. I'm going to go off script here just for a second. It's interesting that at the very end of the story, um, it ends with the birth of Solomon, which is a derivative for the name peace. So it's interesting that the story ends on the birth of a son named Peace. Um, 
So let's look at the first step. Um, first step, number one, if we're going to move from, again, this place to this place, accept what cannot be changed. Number one, accept what cannot be changed. David said, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I thought perhaps the Lord would be gracious and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? You know, let's pay attention to what's happening here. We see David weeping and fasting for his son's life. And it's important to understand just one Old Testament sort of background thing going on here, that in the Old Testament, Fasting is often connected with making a request before God. In fact, the more we, we see Old Testament moments where people were fasting, they would be pleading before God saying, you know, all of my physical needs right now are fading, comparing, comparative to the idea that right now I need to call out to you, God, for this request. Now, what's interesting is that David's servants just thought David was mourning and weeping. And I believe he was also mourning as well, but, but he was really making a request to God. And as a result, David's actions were misinterpreted by the servants. Now, what was it? As we see David, though, now fasting, trying to change God's mind in the declaration of the, of the impending death of his son, he cries out for seven days, and then his son dies. And you know what he sees? He says, God has denied my request. He said, I, 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 I pled to God. I know God is righteous, but I also know God is, uh, shows loving kindness. And, and, I, and, and I thought I could maybe change God's mind, but, but God's judgment is going to be sure and fast and true. There, it's done. Now, David's conviction, remember, was that the God that he was in touch with is one who deals with his children as individuals and responds to their faith. And David really did believe that as much as God was righteous, God could also still change his mind and, and forgive. And so that's why he prayed with that hope of that request. And that's why he was fasting and, and weeping before God to say, God, will you change your mind? But then when the son died, he said, okay, God's will be done. Now, God denied that plea. And I'll be honest, I don't understand all this. It's a heavy moment. But in David's response to God denying his plea for his son to live, we now see a key attitude by David. It's one of acceptance. You know, no matter what loss you've had in your life, the first thing you have to be able to do if you're going to move from here, this place of pain, to a place of peace, is you have to be able to say, it's over. It's over. You have to accept what cannot be changed. Now, acceptance doesn't mean you stop caring. Acceptance doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. And acceptance doesn't mean you even think that what has happened is good. None of that is acceptance. Acceptance simply means I can't change it. I can't change it. You know, David said, my son has died. I can't change that. Now ask yourself, what do you need to accept that's over in your life? What do I need to accept that's over in my life? You know, maybe it is a job. And you keep thinking, maybe they're going to call me back today. And so you sit by the phone saying, they're going to wake up today, and the manager's going to say, oh, what a terrible, terrible mistake I made. Oh, foolish me. I'm going to call Dave back. And so you sit by the phone. But you know that you had made a big mistake. You, maybe you knew you blew it. Maybe you messed something up, and it's over. There isn't going to be another chance. Maybe it's some relationship that's over. And you just keep hoping they're going to come back. You keep hoping they're going to call. They're not coming back. It's over. Maybe you hope that something could be repaired that was broken, and it's not going to get fixed. It's over. You have to accept what cannot be changed. And maybe you need to say that what I need to accept is that a season in my life is over. I'm not 20 or 30 anymore. I'm not even 40s anymore, I I'm in my 50s. It's over. <laughs> Good to hear that you're with me. Um, you know, some of you had a dream and it hasn't happened. It's over. You need to get a new dream. You need to get a new vision. You need to get a new goal for your life. You know, if you don't hear anything else in this message today, I think this is so critical where we look at the story of David. You have to come to that place where you accept what can't be changed. 
I see so many people still stuck back here going, but I want it to be different. It's not. It's over. Accept what can't be changed. Number two, take care of yourself. Uh, Grief, uh, it notes here, David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. You know, grief and loss and tragedy and, and challenge all has a way of removing the desire to even take care of yourself. I mean, it was interesting, actually. I mean, Dan and Marlene are here today, so I, I, Dan, I'm going to have to refer to your video. I'm not really talking at you, but I'm, I'm sort of. But I thought, I thought it was interesting that Marlene, you know, self-revealed enough to say, you know, I even find it kind of hard getting up at quarter to six. I always find it hard getting up at quarter to six. But anyway, uh, <laughs> But, but she's fighting it hard. And I know all of us can resonate with that when we're going through a difficult time. All of a sudden, the energy we normally have for something, all of a sudden, it's not there anymore. And, you know, shock has a way of paralyzing us. Sorrow has a way of slowing us down. So we feel like we're going through mud. We're feeling overwhelmed. But here King David gives us a concrete example of how we can gradually begin to respond. Because he accepted what he couldn't change, he couldn't bring his child back, he was willing to live in the tension of both. Now catch this, and I love this. This, this actually, i got to give credit to Warren. He makes this comment. I love it. He had, a, he had to live in the tension between mourning and living. You can still grieve while you still live, right? Um, To live meant he was going to have to take care of himself physically. If we're going to go on living, we have to take care of ourselves physically as well. That's what David did. You know, I think it was symbolic for David to get up and clean himself up um, because that was his decision to go on living, to re-enter into life, to participate in life again. It's a tough place to be, but we have to learn to live. We have to learn to simultaneously grieve and simultaneously live in this world. I I love what Dan Allender says. We have to learn how to walk with a limp. Got to keep walking, but we may be walking with a limp. And this leads us to our next step in the path of peace. As we begin, we move from this place of pain, of challenge, of sorrow, of suffering, to a place of peace. Um, Thirdly, we need to refocus on God through worship. Notice here that David now, after he cleaned himself up, it says he went to the tabernacle and worshiped. Um, You know, God will help us to do this even as difficult as it seems. You know, I I really believe David went to worship because he knew that in worship, that's a place where we get to deepen our spiritual insight and understanding. That's a place where we can experience the presence of God. You know, David knew that in worship, we begin to catch a glimpse how God is moving and working in the losses, how he's working in our world, how he's working in our lives. It's a place where we can surrender our lives to him in the midst of all the crazy going on. You know what the biggest temptation when we're in a time of grief or sorrow or shock or loss is? I can see it all the time. I, 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 and I, I got names just running through my head right now. We don't, we don't come to church anymore. I say, why, why can't you come to church? Well, I'm a mess. I go, well, that's, that's what church is for. Well, well, well everyone, everyone's going to talk to me. Well, I don't know. I mean, every, as you start to realize, everybody else has pain too. Well, well, when I get myself all put together, I'll come back. I go, really? Wow. Well, I guess I'll see you on the other side. Maybe. Um, so... Please understand that it's not the time to turn away from God. As tempting as it is to go as far in the other direction as we can, and I know why people don't show up at church symbolically, because they're mad, they're shocked, they're heartbroken, they're ashamed, and they do what we also often do. We run. You know, all those emotions. Now, let's be honest. Those emotions are okay to feel that. Please, don't deny and say, I'm not mad. It's okay. Remember last week we said it's okay to even to lament before God and say, God, I'm mad. I'm mad at you. I can't believe this is happening. It's okay to lament before God. It's okay to be upset and heartbroken. But they can't be long-term responses. Long-term, we have to figure out how to enter into God's presence again. You know, God will never abandon you in your anger. He'll never abandon you in your grief. He'll never abandon you in your shame. He'll never abandon you in your doubts. He never will abandon you. 
But those emotions have a way of clouding. They form a fog, if you will, a cloud that keeps us sometimes from receiving the spiritual insight and comfort that God longs to give us. So we see David going to God's house. He went to the tabernacle. Now, on one hand, please understand something. It's really not about a place. You know, we, we all have different ways we connect with God. For some people, it's, it's in the car listening to music. For others, it's going out into nature, not today. But other times, um, other t- places, it's a quiet place. For others, it's in a group. But, but on the other hand, though, I do think going to a public place of worship does give an indication about something. We need to go to a place of worship where there's both stability, continuity, and community. You see, sometimes when we just go off by ourselves to connect with God, I think we're missing something. Because when we come to a place like this, we hear the word of God. We are reminded of the historical truth. We're reminded that we're not the only one going through stuff. And we're also, it's a place where God speaks through his people. That's why we're stronger and better together. Um, That brings us to the fourth step. Do something productive. At, notice this. It says after that, after he did his time of, of worship, he returned to the palace and ate. You know, in our grief and in our shock and in our sorrow and in our sadness and in our struggle, the part of the path to peace is to do something productive. When we get hit with an unexpected challenge or loss, you know what happens? It paralyzes us. You know, one of the things you need to do in, in order to get to this stage is to start moving. Notice here, David moved. It said he returned to the palace and ate. Now, why do you go to the palace? Well, you can say, Dave, that's an easy question. He was King David. That's where, you know, he did his business. That's where he led. Well, that's right. The palace was where he worked. He was basically saying, I'm getting back into life. I'm going to go to work. Now, let me ask you this. This is just a day after his baby died. Do you think David was over his grief? Of course not. You don't ever get over your grief. Remember, you don't get over it. You get through it. That's why this series is called Getting Through. You don't get over it. You get through it. And, and what, what we see here in this part of David's story is this. You don't have to stop mourning to start moving. If you wait until you feel like moving, you're not going to feel like it for a long, long time. So this step of doing something productive is important when you're facing that major loss or struggle. You you know, I love this quote I came across. It says this, grief doesn't paralyze, fear does. We think it's our grief that paralyzes us. I, I I would argue that it's actually fear or despair, as Dan mentioned in his video, or shame. Those are the things that paralyze us, not grief. We can keep moving in the midst of our grief, where we don't, listen, we don't have to stop mourning in order to start moving. We don't have to stop hurting in order to start healing. We are wounded, but we can keep moving, keep walking. Here, here's the next step. We need to keep on loving even in the midst of our pain. Notice this. It says, then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. Now, here's the next step. Keep on loving even in your pain, in spite of your pain. Keep on loving. You know, why do we have to say this? Because when you and I get hurt, the natural reaction when we get hurt is what? I'll pull in. Push away, pull in. Stay away from me, I'm hurt, right? It's a natural reaction. And we build up then giant walls to say, you know, I got hurt last time. I'm not getting hurt again. And we put up big walls because it was all too painful. Now, now, there, now can I tell you, I'm going to give you a secret about how to live life without pain. Do you want no more pain in your life? No more emotional, relational pain in your life? Yeah, okay, write this down. Write this down. Here it is. Don't love anyone. Don't ever love again. And I guarantee you, if you don't love anyone, you'll never have pain. Where are you going? That's kind of harsh. I guarantee you, if you love someone, something, if you love your family, if you love your friends, if you love Christ's church, there will be pain. Welcome. 
Love includes pain. Fact of life. Um, you know, some, in fact, some would even suggest that what deepens our love is actually going through pain. That, I, I think that's actually amazing too. You know, when you lose someone you love, whether they move away, they die, or they reject you, it's heartbreaking. It doesn't matter what causes it, it's heartbreaking. Don't build a wall around yourself and say, I'll never love again. Because if you never love again, you'll never live again. You know, what do you do when someone rejects your love? You redirect it. You know, there's always a lot of people in the world who need your love. If you always wanted to have children and you've been unable to have children, what do you do with that love that you want to express? Well, guess what? In the world right today, there's 137 million orphans. Just connecting dots. Maybe there's a place to express love. Just as an example, you redirect your love. You keep on loving in your pain. You look at what you've got left, not what you've lost. That's what David did. He, did, he recognized because of his sin, he had lost his newborn son. And now he was looking at not what he lost. He looked at what he had left and he had his wife Bathsheba. And it says here, David comforted Bathsheba. You know, just for a moment, it's interesting that nothing's really said about Bathsheba, but, but you got to think about things from her point of view just for a moment. Let's just do that just for a moment, why she needed comfort. You know, she had suffered much, much. She had lost her integrity. She had bore an illegitimate child. She had lost her husband. She then married her lover and then lost her child. I think she went through a lot. She needed comfort. I mean, David could have just spurned her and rejected her, but he instead reached out to her in loving kindness just the way God had reached out to him in mercy and loving kindness. And do you know what happened? That's right. They, 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 they had a child called Solomon. And actually, he became known as the wisest man in the world and the wealthiest man in the world and eclipsed David's kingdom itself. Solomon's kingdom was far greater than David's. And also, through that line, the Messiah would be born. You know, I can't help but think that if David had not been willing to love in the midst of his pain, what not would have happened, right? He kept loving even in the midst of the pain. And, and I just let me just push this to the gospel. Jesus himself knows what it means to love in the midst of pain. It's called the cross. Jesus knows what it's like to keep on loving when you don't feel like loving. Jesus knows what it's like to keep on loving when you feel like your love is being rejected. He keeps on loving. 1 John 3, 16. We know what real love is because Christ gave his life for us. Christ suffered for us. Jesus shows us that real love includes pain last step remember it's not the end of the story when we experience devastating or catastrophic loss of some kind it's normal to say this is it it's over everything is ashes it's the end it's done everything is lost you know in this story david we see accepts what cannot be changed he knows his mournful request before God will not bring his son back to life. So, so guess what he says? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. And, and, and what he's actually only saying is this. Um, because he can't return to me, I know he's dead. I'm going to go to the place where he is. I'm just going to meet him in death. Now, now, I know I've heard Baptist pastors preach on this verse. And what we would say is overextend the meaning. They would say, oh, there's an indication of the hope of heaven. That isn't what David is saying. But we can't help preaching that verse that way. You know why? Because we know the rest of the story. We know that this is not the end of the story because of our hope in Christ. You know, one important thing, remember, we said in Scripture is always to be looking for Jesus in the Scriptures. Every story we're going to show you here, I always want to say, let's look for Jesus somewhere in this story. Let's look for the good news. Because remember, the scriptures give us hope when they point us to Christ. You know, I was reflecting on this story. And there's one place, and I know there's many places we can see Jesus in the story. But here's one place I just want you to take a moment and think about. I see Jesus in the death of an innocent child because of the sins of someone else. Here we see an adulterer murderer shown forgiveness while an innocent person's life was substituted or took the place of the guilty 
since sin had to be paid for it. You know, with that perspective in mind, my mind now goes to the gospel in the New Testament that tells me the same thing. It says in Romans 5.8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ, who was without sin, took our place, was our substitution. You know, the most difficult part of this whole story that we're thinking today as we think about moving from, from loss to a place of peace is that the elephant in the room is that David's loss here occurred because of grievous sin. It was because of self-centered lust. It was because David decided, I'm going to go my way, not God's way. In other words, David sinned. You know, if we're honest, many of the things, as I reflect on my own life, many of the bad things that put me in this bad place, if I have to be honest, is not because I just was unexpectedly hit by them. It was because I made choices that led me there. It was because of my self-centeredness, my going my own way, my sin. We all have our David episodes is what I'm trying to say. And all too often, people who've committed sins and the loss that goes with it are unable to forgive themselves. And so they cut themselves off from God and his church because they expect that they'll only get condemnation if they come back to the church. They think it's over and everything is lost. And what's really sad is that some churches, that's the experience that they are treated with. They are condemned. And what has happened is, is the church leaders and church members have forgotten that the church consists of returned sinners whose task is to reclaim other sinners in the name of Christ. You know, what hope do we have when we know we've sinned before God? Is there a way back into fellowship with God, even from the depths of evil and the loss that comes from it. I think of David's prayer in Psalm 51 that was rooted because of what had happened in his sin with Bathsheba. Listen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Oh, this is where I see Jesus in this story. We see God's abundant mercy in Christ, Christ's death on the cross blots out my transgressions. I'm forgiven in Christ. And whatever loss I'm experiencing right now, because of maybe very self-centered choices, I can come to Christ who paid the penalty for my wrongdoing. And now I have hope. In Christ, I know it's not the end of the story. My past is forgiven. My presence has God's strength. And my future is held by the promise of Christ. It's not over. It's not in ashes. It's not the end of the story. Well, here we are. We're at the end of the, of the message. In a moment, we're going to listen to a song we heard last week. And, I, and, and as I want us to listen to this song again that we played. And um, I want us to use that as a quiet time to ask, what step do I need to take towards that place of peace? Let's, let's think about those, those six steps. Accept what cannot be changed. Take care of yourself. Refocus on God through worship. Do something productive. Keep on loving even in the pain. Remember, it's not the end of the story. Which step do you need to let God speak to you today about? Reflect on those steps. Now, just as the band's coming together, and as we consider what step we need to take on the path of peace, I would like to pray the serenity prayer right now. Most of us have heard a part of the serenity prayer before, but many people have never heard the whole part. We know the first part goes like this. Do you know the first part of the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, that's the part a lot of people know. That's, but that's where it ends for most people. But, but there is actually more. And, and I want to pray the whole serenity prayer. And then, like I said, reflect on what step God wants you to take right now. As you're moving from your place of struggle, your place of loss, maybe because of your choices, You want to say, God, I want to move from this place to a place of peace. Let's hear this serenity prayer in its fullness. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. 
trusting in your will that you will make things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Lord, I'm tired, so tired from walking, and Lord, I'm so alone, Lord, the dark is creeping in, it's creeping up to swallow me, I think I'll stop, rest here a while. This is all that I can say right now. This is all.